Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Now, we should all be cautious of caring for our environment and making small, sustainable changes in our day-to-day lives. So why not start by making some delicious changes? Stone Lee Wines create their premium wine in New Zealand, and it's made from 100% sustainably sourced grapes and is vegan certified. Stone Lee's Sauvignon Blanc expresses vibrancy and fresh flavours of the Marlborough region and is a minimal intervention wine and collaborates with nature. We have a unique discount for our listeners so you can get 20% off Stone Lee Sauvignon Blanc exclusively on Amazon using the code STONELY20. So, did you know there's nearly 20,000 different species of moss and their relatives worldwide, with over a 1,000 of those in the UK? And did you know that sphagnum moss is almost wholly responsible for the creation and maintenance of peat bogs? They prevent harmful carbon from being released into the atmosphere. And in this week's episode, we talk to Dr Neil Bell, a bryologist at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, about the hidden world of moss. So, Neil, welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Hey, good to see you. So, I think I really speak for Ellen as well when I when I say that we know very little about moss. We only know that we maybe line our hanging baskets with it or try and rake it out of the lawn. But we're really looking forward to learning more. But we always like to start these interviews with a little bit of a kind of a, a softener, we might call it, which is a quick fire question round. So, we're going to ask you a series of this or that. And you need to answer as quickly as possible. And you've got a good Wi-Fi connection, so no excuses on that today, Neil. Okay. <laughs> right. Great okay, self. I'm going to start off. Peanut butter or Marmite? Marmite. Or well, almond butter, if I can get it. <laughs> oh, ooh, that's, that's just thrown a curveball in there, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> morning bird or night owl? Definitely night owl. Okay, peonies or roses? Oh, um... Roses, I think. Oh. Do you have a tidy desk or a messy desk? I have an extremely messy desk, I'm afraid. Oh. Piles of books and um, stuff sort of falling off. And everyone says that, I think, because everyone, everyone does say that. It's very intelligent, <laughs> that is why. Okay, tea or coffee? Coffee, definitely. A bit of a Ooh, coffee nurse, nice. I submit. Do you read a paper book or are you an audio book listener? I'm a paper book, old fashioned reader, I'm oh. afraid. Dogs or cats? Cats. Well, I'm getting more into dogs the older I get, I must mm. admit. But uh, So these are their roles, but um, traditionally... Sure. Okay. Final question. Final question is beach or mountains? Oh, definitely mountains, I'm afraid. I knew you would say that. <laughs> Beaches uh, aren't very good for bry fights. I mean, basically, bry fights, mosses aren't... Um, they, they aren't really any marine mosses. So, uh, whereas mountains are brilliant for mosses. So, yeah, always mountains. Sure. (laughs) I knew you would say it that for that reason. And um, also, like you said before, almost everyone says messy desk who comes onto the podcast. For sure. Um, And I like you said roses because quite often we get peonies. So, I was like, oh, let's have someone to say roses. So, that's (laughs) right. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's a way of introducing you. Now everyone knows exactly who you are. Uh, <laughs> but we would love to find out more about you and your role at the uh, Royal Botanic Garden of Edinburgh. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm a bryologist, and that's uh, a term that most people haven't heard. So it, it often it sounds like biologist, but it's actually bryologist, and that means I'm someone who a scientist who studies bryophytes. And bryophytes are mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So three 
separate groups which we now treat together under the name bryophytes. But because no one's heard of bryophytes, then I tend to talk about mosses more than I talk about bryophytes. But when I say mosses, I'm really meaning liverworts and hornworts as well. I'm really talking about bryophytes. So what I my, my background is in systematics and taxonomy. So I'm interested in the evolution of these groups, um, their diversity, how they're related to each other, and how we classify and name them, which sounds a bit boring, but actually, unless we actually know what things are and whether one thing or another thing is the same thing or different things or how distantly they are related to each other, we don't really know how to go about um, quantifying the diversity we have or or conserving them. So it's an important, um, it's important aspect of biology, I think. And in Scotland, we actually have a very interesting bryophyte flora. So the, the mosses and liverworts we have in Scotland are actually as interesting and as diverse as almost anywhere else in the world. And that's not the case for our native vascular plant flora, so our, our flowering plants, which is interesting, but it's a kind of, you know, if compared to the tropics, it's not a highly diverse flora. But because of the way that mosses are, um, and because of the particular climate we have in, in Britain, and particularly the west coast of Britain, where it's continually moist and we don't have all that much of a, a temperature difference between summer and winter, what we call an oceanic climate, uh, for various reasons, which I'll talk about later, about what bryophytes are, that means we have a very diverse moss flora. Mm -hmm. And there aren't many places in the world that have that sort of climate. It's really just um, the west coast of Britain, places like New Zealand, Australia, uh, the West Coast, North America, Southwest, South America, these these very sort of oceanic areas that have a constant mm -hmm. stream of weather systems coming in from oceans. So, yeah, so um, uh, I'm interested in looking at the diversity of the bryophytes we have, the mosses and the verworts we have in Scotland, and then relating that to uh, related species that we have elsewhere in the world, and then quantifying that diversity and then trying to conserve that diversity. Mm. You just, you okay. said at the beginning of that that it that might sound boring, but that didn't sound boring at all to me. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm <laughs> defensive. Is I think when you mention taxonomy, people tend to tend to roll their eyes because it's sort of they associate it with just sort of giving names to things, and it's maybe a sort of human uh, pattern that we're imposing on the the infinite variety of nature. But actually, there are discreetly different things in nature, and by naming these things we recognise these things and we're able to relate them to each other and, and understand them. Yeah, That's cool. it's important. And I'm sorry, I know Michael's going to ask the next question, but I just really wanted to say, like, at school or in careers or anyone who is interested in, you know, horticulture or natural environment, mm. these kind of careers just aren't known. Do you know what I mean? No one really knows yeah. that you can do this really, really fascinating, interesting and important work. So I love that you are, you know, doing it and on the podcast talking about it because hopefully, you know, people out there will realise that there is so much, so many careers, you know, mm, that have this fascinating kind of aspect to them. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like the, I feel like the tide is starting to turn a little bit on that. And I sometimes wish um, I was younger and at school now because I'm sure you'd say the same, Neil. When I was at school, I was completely an outsider because I had a love of plants. And, you know, yeah. I always look for my friends and you guys have heard it on the podcast many times. So it's nice that we are seeing a bit of a shift there, but there's still a lot more to do in terms of uh, kind of seeing horticulture as a viable career for a lot of young yeah. people too. And that is obviously part of why we run this podcast. So Absolutely. You know, I'm not a horticulturist, as you say, but uh, certainly uh, in terms of, um, different aspects of botany yeah. and, and and natural history. I think uh, there's, there's more of an awareness that there's a, a greater totally. diversity than just the definitely the seen a change. Yeah. So on to the interview and uh, kind of moss. Then, what is the top line on moss, and why is it so different to other plants? Then, Neil. So so moss is a plant. So it's a, a green plant, the same as flowering plants and conifers and ferns, but maybe about something like 500 million years ago, there was, we now think there was a split in the evolutionary tree. So it's so all the, the land plants, what we call the, the embryophytes, probably evolved from a single common ancestor, which evolved from algae. 
And then uh, at some point, po possibly a bit over 500 million years ago, there was a split in the, the land plant lineage. And one of the lineages led to all the plants we're most familiar with, that's flowering plants and conifers and ferns and things like that. And the other split led to what we what we call the bryophytes. So that's the mosses, liverworts and hornworts. And uh, it's really only quite recently we've known that the bryophytes are a natural group. We used to think that perhaps um, the, that uh, liverworts had split off first and then mosses split off and then hornworts and then you had the rest of, of plants. But it's really just in the past 10 years we now know that bryophytes are, are, are a natural group. They all evolve from a, a common ancestor. And it seems that bryophytes and other plants have taken a different path in the way that they have evolved to, to live. So bryophytes have a different relationship to water than most other plants do. So we're used to thinking of plants as having roots and storing water, taking taking water and nutrients up from the soil and then mm -hmm. storing um, that, that water and, and nutrients in the plant and then resisting drying out. What, what mosses tend to do is they, they kind of ebb and flow with the availability of moisture in the environment. So they, they need water, obviously, to to thrive and to uh, and to photosynthesize and to uh, and to grow. But they're equally capable of drying out and um, and surviving a dry state for quite long periods of time. In in, in many cases, um, and the, associated with that is they don't have any roots, so they're taking their water and their nutrients directly from um, from rainwater and from the atmosphere, rather than taking it up from the soil. And they're not transporting it around their their um, their bodies like vascular plants are with vascular systems. Instead, they're taking that water and nutrient over the, the the entire outer surface of the plant, and that means that they can't really be very big because if you're getting all your water and nutrients over your entire surface, um, then if you're a big thing, it's not going to get all the way into the into the center very quickly. Um, so you basically have to be small in order to um, take take water and nutrients from the environment. But that also means that you're going to dry out again quite quickly. So you're dependent on the availability of water to, to thrive. Um, so that means you tend to be very diverse in places that are wet. At the same time, you can also resist desiccation and resist drying out better than many other plants do. So basically it's a different way of living and that different way of living, that different ecology has produced um, different growth forms and um, a different type of morphological diversity. So that's quite a long answer. <laughs> no, no. Oh, do you know what? We're, we're both sitting here completely absorbed in what you're saying. <clears throat> you know, when for the home gardener, yeah, moss is like one of those things that are considered, you know, unattractive. Growing in the shady spot in between paving slabs in the lawn and they want to get rid of it, all of that. But that's not really the case, is it? Because moss is actually essential to human life. Is that right? Well, yes. I mean, you could say all, all organismal groups are essential to human life, but there's, there's certain things that mosses are doing which we would certainly be in trouble if they weren't doing so uh, particularly in northern temperate areas we have large amounts of land that are covered in uh, in peat bog and um and that is actually a very significant carbon sink so there's uh, i think it's something like 20 percent of the the carbon that's stored in natural ecosystems on earth is actually in the form of peat it's um, a really quite quite large number, and that peat is basically um, undecomposed um, sphagnum moss, which uh, represents a large amount of carbon. Which, if it was released into the atmosphere, if that started to decompose, uh, that would be a major accelerator of climate change. So, so mosses are uh, are acting as a carbon sink in that sense. They're also controlling the way that water flows through the environment. Uh, so they're acting like uh, a buffer in many cases. So if you think of the way that um, uh, the flooding happens, if you get a sudden downpour, then um, 
you're going to get a situation where the rivers perhaps are going to um, are going to burst their banks because um, the, the water is flowing through that system very quickly. But if you have upstream, say on large um, mire systems or in very mossy forests in, in the tropics, uh, large amounts of bryophytes, and because of that different relationship with water that I spoke about earlier, when it rains, if it's sudden down power, these, these bryophytes are going to suck up all that water and then gradually release it. So a bit like a giant sponge in a sense. So um, you can think of mosses as acting like a buffer for the way that water flows through ecosystems. And in that way, they prevent flooding. So it's a bit like if you turn a tap on and um, um, and then you're, you, the, uh, you have a plug in the sink, um, then the, um, the sink is going to fill up and overflow. But if you have... Um, if you take the plug out, then uh, the, the the water is going to flow through the system in a more, more gradual way. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think Ellen might have had a delivery arrive. <laughs> but we're good now. We can cope. Now, do all mosses grow in moist conditions? And will they all look like moss that we expect? Because I know um, recently I wrote about a book, um, wrote about a plant in the book that I've put together, Hortus Curious, and it's Solanginella lepidophila, which is yeah. actually like a type of spike moss, isn't yes. it? How does it's a spike moss or club moss differ to the mosses that we're talking about here? So, so club mosses aren't mosses. <laughs> this is really confusing. So Yeah, yeah, it's good to explain that. Um, Upertia, things like that. They're called club mosses, but that's just a common name. So um, someone at some point thought they looked a bit like mosses, so they were called club mosses. Uh -huh. But actually, um, Sladinella is is, um, is part of a group of plants which is actually part of the, the same major group of plants that includes ferns and conifers. It's split off quite early, in fact. So, uh -huh. so the club mosses are the first group that splits off uh, the rest of vascular plants, but they're not actually mosses. So it's uh, it's a very misleading term. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, um, but but um, many mosses look a bit like what you might expect mosses to look like. They're, right. they're, There's no surprising ones out there. <laughs> well, there are. <laughs> there are definitely. So, so, of course, when I'm talking about moss, I'm talking about bryophytes, and that's including liverworts and hornworts as well. And, and hornworts... Um, some of them look quite like mosses. In fact, most of them look a bit like mosses. They have stems and leaves. But other ones, and in fact, the ones most people are perhaps familiar with are what we call phalloid. So these are the things that look like sort of rubbery plates that are growing over the top of your plant pots and things like that. Okay. Um, and they're, they're bryophytes. So they're part of this group, which is liverworts, um, which in turn is part of the group that is bryophytes, which includes mosses. And, and they've adopted a completely different growth form. So even though they're quite close related to these leafy liverworts that look a bit like club mosses, um, their, their, their actual growth form is completely different. And, and hornworts are like phalloid liverworts. Uh, they have this sort of plate-like, um, slightly fleshy-looking phallus, um, which sort of grows directly on the substrate. So yeah, so it's so, so not all... Not all mosses, not all bryophytes look necessarily like what you might expect them to. Um, just sort of going back, though, to you mentioned earlier how many gardeners think of mosses as being um, a bit of a nuisance. This sort of green, green stuff which is growing um, in the corners. It's sort of somehow untidy and messy. And I, my, my theory about that is that it's just to do with the sizes that these plants are. So they're they're not microscopic, so you can see them. They're not, it's not like they're um you need a microscope to actually see that they're there. So they're there in the periphery of your vision, but they're not so big that you can see um the actual shapes of the leaves or um or how they differ from each other or the the morphological diversity which exists between one species and another. So it's so I think mosses have this bad rap because this, I'm lucky enough to be in this sort of um, uh, uncomfortable zone between things that are big enough for us to see properly and yeah. things that are are too small for us to see at all. Yeah. So the the trick is to actually just look a bit more closely. So so rather than saying all this green mossy stuff in the corner of my vision, which I don't want to look at, um, is actually ugly. Just actually just try looking a bit closer. So um, obviously. 
you know, I, I'm now at the age where I need um, contact lenses or glasses to see things very close up. But uh, um, and obviously, the older you get, that's more of a problem. But all all biologists tend to carry a lens around with them, so um, it's a bit like the stereotype of the old botanist with this giant magnifying glass. Except <laughs> these days we use smaller ones; they're, they're, they're called hand lenses. Yeah. And if you get used to wandering around with a hand lens and just looking at um, mosses when you see them um, on wall tops or in the garden, you'll realise that they're actually not ugly and unpleasant looking at all. They're actually very diverse and very beautiful. And there's lots of um, amazing shapes and forms and colours as well, which you're just not aware of unless you look a bit more closely. Mm. And that's one thing I'm trying to get across the book. I think one thing that uh, photography has been able to do in recent years because um, uh, it's become easier to photograph um, bryophytes since, since digital photography came along. Could you can imagine when you had film uh, cameras? Um, actually, it was a bit of a hit and miss affair trying to photograph something as small as a moss. You'd take lots of shots on the same film and then develop it, and they'd all be out of focus or they'd all be underexposed or whatever. But with digital photography, it's more of an iterated process. So there's a, there's been an explosion of just amazing images of bryophytes in the past 10 years. Yeah. Um, and I say Des Callahan, who's taken photographs, most photographs of my book is a, um, one of the, the best exponents of that. And I'm hoping that just with, uh, with more people um, seeing photographs like that and actually just taking the time to look closely at the mosses around them, they'll realize that they're, they're, they're not ugly at all. Welcome back to the third and final instalment of updates, of floral updates here from me, uh, Ben Cross here at Crossland's Flower Nursery. Um, so I've ran you through back in April where the crop was really growing quite vigorously. And then we had the May update, which is where we were harvesting lots and lots of stems. And now we are in June. And uh, it's about 30 odd degrees here in the greenhouse, about 20 odd degrees outside. And let's say even with the vents up, uh, the soil temperature now is about 20 odd degrees and the air temperature is about 30 odd degrees. So the roots are going more dormant now. So we're harvesting more than the plants are regenerating. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been harvesting over 20,000 stems a day. <laughs> so have been, been super busy, but we're actually now harvesting more than the plants are regenerating regenerating because that soil temperature is on the rise it's on the increase and what the roots of the Ulstrom area do they trap in all available um, water and they go into a period of basically dormancy. So you guys, you listeners, on a hot summer's day might want to sort of have, have some PIMS, a G&T, or go to the beach, chill out. And that's exactly what the uh, roots are doing now. They're going into a period of dormancy and chill out mode. Uh, but if we look after the roots and the plants all through the hot summer months, they'll regenerate. And then we'll have what you call an autumn flush. So we harvest millions of stems through the course of the year with spring and autumn being when they're in their pomp at their best and they're in season. But even though it's summer, another sustainability point with what we're doing here, growing the British Ulstromera, it's classed and known as a dry crop. So we only water the crop for 20 minutes once a month in the winter, 20 minutes once every 10 days in the spring and autumn. And even now in the height of summer, we're only watering for 20 minutes a bed once every 10 days. So we're not watering every day. We're not watering every other day. We're not even watering every week. So it's a nice sustainable dry crop um, but yeah the beds are now thinning out are becoming a bit more sparse and uh, one of the main jobs we're doing is weeding and we don't use any chemicals for that either that is just getting on your hands and knees and pulling out all the weeds and let, letting them rot back on top the soil so we don't remove our weeds from the greenhouses we make sure the root of the weed is taken out of the ground and we just lay that on top of the flower beds as ground cover so all the goodness of the weed rots and goes back into the soil and it acts as ground cover so it stops more weeds from growing so yeah, we're picking more weeds than flowers at the moment. But um, as I say, it's been great uh, for Michael and Ellen having me on this uh, awesome podcast. As I say, this is the uh, the final part of the trilogy updates here from Crosslands. Uh, hopefully they'll invite me back because it's been really good to... Uh, 
to talk to you guys, to you listeners. If you want to find out more uh, about me, Ben Cross, Crossland's Flower Nursery, and my British Flowers Rock campaign, uh, you can look me up on Instagram and Twitter, at Alstromaria Ben, and you can type in Crossland's Flower Nursery into Facebook, and there's loads of videos and links to podcasts and lots of YouTube stuff that I've done as well. Um, as I say, the British Flowers Rock movement is really, really important to me. Uh, I say over 90% of flowers in the UK are now imported and the movement that I started back in 2014 is just educating the British public um, to source homegrown and not flown blooms and to understand a little bit more a little bit more about it so so you can find me up on instagram twitter and facebook but once again thanks to michael and ellen uh, for being so rad and cool and, and having me on here on the podcast and um yeah i'm not say i'm not sure when i'll see you listeners again but it's been great giving you updates and um yeah british flowers rock ulstrom area rock i hope you've enjoyed it take care everyone Mosses are just amazingly tactile. You know, I if I see moss, I can't help but just kind of gently rub yeah. my hands on them. But when you look so closely, the detail is so fascinating. But at the same time, it's stopping you from doing all the other stuff that's going on in your mind. And you're just focusing in on this amazing, you know, like it's growing on earth it's in and you just stop and just look and like wow and you can really really appreciate moss and you know, like you said it's got like this bad rap for growing in between uh you know paving stones and whatever else but this is something that's really essential um and it's like its own mini forest so when you yeah. look really close it kind of looks like little trees and you've said yourself that you know it's filled with um predators and grazers and that kind of thing like yeah. can you expand on what life is going on within those like mini forests yeah completely so i mean basically the same principles that, that work in ecology at, at the macro scale also work at the micro scale so we have you have predators and grazers at, at all scales and and because mosses uh or particularly mosses but also some liverworts have stems and branches some of them actually look like miniature trees and for the mm -hmm. same reason that trees look like trees they're trying to get their photos photosynthetic um leaves above um things around them they're trying to photosynthesize um uh grow um so it's, it's naturally adopt a similar shape at a smaller scale um and and that produces obviously that's a habitat then for for many microorganisms so things like um mites which are related to spiders um a very diverse group springtails uh tardigrades which are these amazing things that are commonly known as known as water bears they they they're, they're microscopic but they they look like um little kind of something like moss piglets just this amazing animals um so so all these things are many of them are grazing on microscopic fungi that might be growing on the on the moss on the bryophytes uh, some of them might eat little bits of the leaves of the bryophytes uh, many of the the mites and springtails will actually be eating other mites and springtails um, so there's a, a whole um, ecological web a whole um, um, sort of food web going on at that scale um, in, in the bryophyte in the bryophyte forest it is it's just like this little mini forest beneath your feet it's yeah. fascinating i love it Absolutely. and like you said like the macro photography now is just so awesome and you can really get an appreciation for what it's all about yeah so neil i think probably one of the mosses that we probably recognize the most is kind of like maybe sphagnum moss because we're then using that to top our bulb pots in the in the winter, obviously line hanging baskets. But this is a really, really important component of the peat bogs. And I know you touched on it briefly earlier, but can you expand a little bit on sphagnum moss in particular? And and also, how, how is it harvested from the wild as well? Is it is it grown commercially? Because, like, you know, we obviously buy it to use in terrariums, et cetera. Is that still a good sustainable practice too? Yeah, I, I, I probably shouldn't comment too closely in that because it's not something that I'm um I, I may not be I, I don't want to kind of unnecessarily criticize anyone who's but um who's, who's selling sphagnum but uh certainly traditionally uh sphagnum harvesting has been very very damaging uh I think there is no there are no moves to um uh, to cultivate 
sphagnum. It's not something I'm okay. uh, particularly up on, but um, but but sphagnum is um, has a really important role. As, as I said, I, mean, I touched on it earlier in relation to um, um, uh, the fact that it's keeping that peat that we have mm -hmm. in our peat box and decomposing and keeping uh, really a vast amount of um, of carbon in the soil. So so what what peat is is basically it's a bit like coal on a, a, a slightly less old time scale. So it's um, it's plant material which hasn't decomposed because of the conditions in which it's been um, it's been stored. So so most plants when they die they rot. You get fungi, um, other other organisms digest them, and then that's all these organic compounds, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, fats, uh, which are basically um, based on carbon, uh, are broken down and released into the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide. And, and what peat is, is undecomposed sphagnum moss. And the reason it builds up over hundreds of years is because um, it isn't decomposing, it's basically accumulating. And the reason it's able to do that is because the the top layer of the of the bog, um, which is the living layer of sphagnum, um, is keeping it permanently moist and acidic as well, and that's um, inhibiting decomposition. And the reason sphagnum is able to do this is because of its unique structure at a microscopic level. So if you get a leaf of sphagnum and you put it under the microscope, you'll see it's got this sort of strange. Um, almost sort of network-like appearance to it. And what that is, it's a kind of uh, matrix of photosynthetic cells, green cells, uh, which in sphagnum are quite narrow. And then between these, you have these giant, uh, big empty cells. Um, and what these are doing is holding water. So basically the entire structure of the plant is like a giant sponge. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's evolved to... Uh, to, to have a large part of its, um, its volume um, as empty space, which can actually just draw water in. So, so, so all mosses can hold a, a large amount of water, but sphagnum is just leaps and bounds um, above all of the rest because it has these special cells that are just designed to hold water. And the reason it has these is because by doing that, it's able to keep the surface of the, the bog permanently wet, pre preventing decomposition and preventing other um, plants that might otherwise grow there um, from growing there because most plants don't like these very waterlogged, very acidic conditions. It's also actively pumping uh, protons um, uh, out into the soil, so it's actually actively uh, making the, the peat acidic, and that's another thing which is, is preventing decomposition. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's really important that we maintain in, um, in, in Britain and Ireland particularly, but um, uh, really everywhere in the, uh, particularly the northern boreal zone where the, there's large amounts of peat, maintain the living layer of, um, of, of sphagnum moss on tops of the, the bogs that we have. Because when that living layer is stripped away or if the bog is drained, and it all dries out, or if you plant trees in the wrong places. So we're all aware that um, uh, tree planting is a great thing for uh, offsetting carbon, and you know, we need more, more trees in the right places. But there are certain places we don't want trees, and one of these places is um, a healthy sphagnum bog, because obviously trees have roots, they will suck the moisture um, out of the soil, that will then dry out the peat, uh, that the sphagnum will die, um, you will then get the decomposition of that um, undecomposed organic matter in the peat, which has maybe built up over thousands of years. Okay. So, um, so that's why, um, uh, it, for instance, if you go to um, to Ireland, they've traditionally used uh, peat on a large scale to um, to fuel uh, power stations. So they've they've stripped large amounts of peat from from bogs, and obviously that that degrades the bog. Um, Traditionally, draining um, peat bogs for agriculture has 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 been a, a popular activity because you can then use the soil for other things. But that's obviously also also bad for the um, uh, uh, sphagnum and the peat. So yeah, so we have to. I think it's increasingly now we're aware that um, peat bog restoration and peat bog maintenance is something that's really has a critical role to play in um, um, uh, against climate change. Yeah, I mean, it's a hot topic at the moment, that's for sure. 
Um, but talking not just about um, the sphagnum moss, are all mosses at risk, uh, or is it just that? So, so, um, so not all. But yeah. So, 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 like other plants, uh, there are some mosses which are very common and are weedy, and you will find everywhere, and and they're not at risk. Um, but. Um, uh, but there are many mosses that are at risk, um, and from things like climate change and habitat destruction in particular. So uh, the sorts of um, sort of permanently wet habitats that tend to support a, a large amount of uh, moss diversity um, are often the ones that are, are, are threatened by agricultural expansion and, and changes in land use. Um, climate change is itself impacting um, the distribution of many bryophyte species. So um, it's a bit unpredictable how climate change is going to affect the, the very diverse bryophyte habitats we have in the west of Britain. So we have in the west of Britain these um, uh, what we call temperate rainforests. So um, these very mossy uh, oak woodlands in sheltered ravines in the west and north of, of, of uh, Britain, which are just incredibly diverse for bryophytes. Um, and certain habitats you get on on wet heaths at certain altitude in the, the more sheltered parts of the mountains in, in, in the west of Britain. These habitats rely on, it's not so much a huge amounts of rainfall as a continual distribution of rainfall throughout the year. So there, there are hardly any dry days. Um, uh, I think if you go to a certain um, contour of precipitation, you can find um, that just uh, clips the uh, the west coast of of Scotland, in which it's um, uh, in which you have more than about two hundred and fifty wet days per year. So basically, it's it's hardly ever dry, <laughs> and bryophytes love that. And certain certain bryophyte species can only survive in that sort of habitat. So it's a bit unpredictable how that climate is going to be affected by climate change. We know that it's actually going to get wetter in um, in, in Britain to some extent. Um, we're going to have um, um, wetter winters um, with with climate change, but we're also potentially going to have more prolonged dry periods during the summer. So we may potentially lose that an element of that oceanicity that we have in our climate, which is really important for bryophytes. Another thing which climate change is going to do to bryophytes in Britain is um, relates to what we call uh, snowbed bryophytes. So these are ones that are growing. Um, in places in the on our highest mountains, say in the Cairngorms, where you get patches of snow that persist um, almost all the way throughout the, the the summer, so it will snow in maybe the first time in December, and then the snow won't really disappear until maybe August. So there's um, yeah. there are particular places um, at the top of the Cairngorms. Uh, these were very limited in extent, where you get these little patches of snow that are persisting, and there's a certain suite of bryophytes which can, uh, which are about, about the only plants that can grow in the habitat because nothing else can get established there because um, because of such a short the short growing season. But the bryophytes partially related to their ability to to kind of take over in a desiccated state or in a kind of um, a not very active state. They're able certain species are able to persist in these habitats, um, but. If, if climate if climate warming means that we lose these snowbed habitats, then other plants will just move in and will completely lose these these bryophytes from from Britain at least. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's surprising though that there, there are certain threats to bryophytes that you wouldn't necessarily think of, um, and and one of the uh, the most important ones actually is um, is, is invasive um, and what the, the invasive rhododendron ponticum. <laughs> yeah. So, so just the common rhododendron. Um, of course, we know it was introduced. It was, well, I think, it was native to Britain before the last ice age, but it's um, it's now no longer native to Britain. But it's been reintroduced, and of course, it's very popular in, in sort of Highland estates and things. Mm -hmm. And it's now um, it's it has an incredible ability to spread and form <coughs> sort of monoculture in certain places in the north and west, which happen to also to be some of the most diverse places for bryophytes. Mm -hmm. So, so rhododendron can basically just choke out bryophytes from um, uh, steep-sided river valleys in, in the west of Scotland, and it's, it's very difficult to control. So, so yeah, so there are um, many bryophytes with a threat. I mean, there's some bryophytes which are very specific um, requirements. Um, so maybe they grow on... Um, <coughs> uh, 
heavy metal soils or something like that, and uh, um, thus they need this um, very high concentration of copper in the soil in order to grow. And obviously, then they're dependent on um, on, on that soil being available. So, so yeah, so I mean, different different bryophytes are are threatened by different things, and and some are threatened and some aren't, but uh, but many are. Okay. okay. Yeah, that um, was a good explanation. Thank you. Yeah, and taking it in a slightly different direction now, are any of the mosses indeed edible or do any of them have medicinal properties? Because I know that sphagnum was used to wrap wounds during World War I, for example. So what different uses could mosses have? Yeah, so the reason sphagnum was used as a wound dressing in, in the First World War is it's it, it relates to the properties, exactly to the properties I was speaking about earlier in terms of its ability to absorb water and also mm -hmm. its um, ability to make things acidic. So, and that in the context of medicine means that it's, um, it's, it's basically antiseptic. It's, it's able to create an antiseptic environment around a wound. So, um, so in the first of all, in particular, there was um, um, a, a very large effort to harvest moss from uh, from places in Scotland and the rest of Britain, and that was then dried out and then used to um, as, as a wound dressing um, due to its extreme absorbent properties because of that cell structure I was speaking about earlier and its um, uh, ability to um, uh, to to keep uh, wounds relatively sterile. Um, but I find, I mean, because most most mosses have leaves that are only a, a single layer of cells thick, so that's why they have that sort of translucent appearance. So if you if you kind of look closely at a moss and there's light shining through it, um, it, it kind of almost shines, and and that's because some of the light is passing straight through it because the leaf is only a, a single layer of cells thick, um, and that relates to the um, <clears throat> its different relationship to water that I was speaking about earlier. It's, um, it needs to have a large surface area to Take in water, which also means it dries out <clears throat> very quickly. But that means there's not there's not actually much to moss. So um, if you're going to eat it for nutrition, you'd have to eat an awful lot of it, <laughs> and that's why it is edible at the end of the day. It's so so um, if, if, if as a human you you um, you eat most moss species, it's um, it's probably not going to taste it very much, and um, it's you're probably not going to get much from it. But it's it's very unlikely to do you any harm. I think <laughs> there are there are some liverworts that have um, certain secondary compounds, certain certain metabolites, which um, we don't know all that much about, and some of them are being investigated for medicinal properties. Mm -hmm. um, so in some of the phalloid liverworts, uh, some of the, the leafy liverworts, like um, there's a species called Fulania, and when biologists are in the field trying to identify different species of Fulania, sometimes they will cross them between their fingers and smell them because mm -hmm. there are these very volatile compounds that we have um, mm -hmm. in the tissues, which so maybe one species will smell like 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 one thing and another species won't smell at all. So that's that's yeah. used for identification. And so some of these compounds are um most of these compounds are not very well known. So there is a potential for these to have uses as um as drugs perhaps or um, <coughs> other other things. But it's really just um, it's a very young area of um exploration, but it's just another reason to um to to value bryophytes as um, um, a component of, of biodiversity with um, um, with perhaps untapped potential. It's exciting. It's just another yeah. avenue to explore, you know. Um, I think that there is one more question that our listeners are going to be desperate to know the answer to. Hmm. Moss in lawns, <laughs> is that good or bad? Um. Yeah, well, I'm obviously biased. I mean, I I, I, I love mossy lawns, <laughs> um, so it, it, it's it's one of these questions. I mean, it depends. What I mean, what is the function of a lawn? Why, why are you growing along the lawn in the first place? What what are you trying to get out of it? I mean, I um, uh, when I was growing up, my parents had a, a lawn which um, they weren't particularly into gardening. It would be it would be mowed regularly throughout the summer. <coughs> it had lots of moss in it so things like um uh there's a particular one called retididelphus sclerosis which is um has these little leaves that are kind of uh, bent over backwards and uh, and that was that was all throughout the lawn but um i i never found that um problematic it, it actually makes the lawn quite springy and sort of quite nice yeah. to sit on yeah. and more so, I mean, <laughs> 
a lot of it is all grass and it's if it's cut very close it's, it's actually got a hard surface to sit on whereas a, a mossy lawn is um um a little more a little more springy and nice so, i think it's lovely like it, yeah. you, know, when you walk on it it's nice on your feet you don't have to be mowing your lawn you know they're you've got little mini forests as we've just said like yeah. in your lawn Fitly. You know, why not have some moss in your lawn? Yeah. yeah. And it's, right. it's going to support, if you have a kind of a mosaic of moss and grass, that's going to support far greater diversity at, at, at perhaps a scale that you're not quite aware of than yeah. just having a monoculture of um, of one species of grass, especially if that grass is cut very short and uh, um, is, is not um, is not able to, to, to support much else. Mm. Totally. Cool. Well, thank you. This has been a really, really interesting interview. We've learned loads and I think our listeners will feel the same. Tell us, though, you have got a book that is, I think, already out by now. Just give us a little lowdown on the book and where people can get a copy. Yeah, so the book is called The Hidden World of Mosses, and um, it was officially published the 31st of March. It's, it can be bought online from the Royal Botanic Garden shop. So if you go to um, HTTPS uh, double forward stroke RBGE shop dot org, um, you should find it there. Probably the easiest thing is just to to Google for hidden world of mosses and hopefully the book should uh, should pop up. And th- and then just again, I think I mentioned at the beginning, but just to, to give a plug to um, to Des Callahan. So in many ways, it's uh, this book is as much. A collection of images with some text, as it is a collection of text with some images. So these images are mostly produced by um, this guy called Death, Death Callahan, who's he's also a biologist. Um, he does um, contract work for um, uh, uh, Nature Scott and uh, uh, Natural England, and um, he's a, he, so he's an excellent biologist. He's really one of the, the best biologists in, in Britain, but he's also an excellent photographer. So he's uniquely able to combine these two skills and has produced the amazing photographs that are in this book. You know, cool. I think that will be a lovely book for anyone who's interested in finding out more about moss and just really appreciating, you know, how important they are and, you know, get down on your hands and knees and have a good look at some moss, you know, all around. Absolutely. And if if you're more interested, if you develop an interest in, in mosses and, and other bryophytes, then the, the British Bryological Society is worth investigating. So that's the, uh, the society in Britain which, um, which deals with, uh, with bryophytes. And they organise meetings so you can uh, go out with other, other people. And you, uh, the best way to learn about the different types of mosses there are is to be shown them by, by people yeah. that know already um yeah. you also have a field guide um to uh if, if you again if you google for um a field guide and bryophytes in britain you'll you'll get the um british biological society field guides should come out and that's that's the best starting book if you're trying to, trying to identify bryophytes my book's more uh, um an introduction just to people who don't know anything about bryophytes but if you want to actually try and identify them then then get the bbs field guide and, and maybe think about joining the british biological society perfect so that's really cool thank you so much i've learned so much i all i feel a bit like i have to just go away and let that all absorb a little bit now <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure maybe thank, you. The book, Ellen. <laughs> cool. yeah. thank you very much neil thank you neil thank you thanks so much Well, everybody, um, it would appear that Michael and Alan are are liking my contributions to the podcast because here I am doing another one. Although saying that, sadly, I do have a funny feeling that this might be the last one because I think they're finally getting fed up of me. (laughs) So enjoy this one. So saying that, I thought I would make this podcast a semi-sensible one and that is due down to a personal experience that I had recently and I think it is something that us gardeners should be more careful of. So I, I had a recent appointment with the doctor and he said to me, he said, Andrew, how many days a year do you spend out in the sun? And I said, well, living in the UK, I spend both of those sunny days we get in the sun. But jokes aside, he said, um, 
those marks on your face do need looking at more closely by a dermatologist. And I thought, oh, okay, this sounds a bit more serious than I thought it would, was initially. So off I pop down to the hospital, meet a lovely chap who proceeds to tell me off for the next half an hour, 45 minutes about my um, stupidity with the sun over the years. So I've been a gardener since leaving school. I'm now 41 years old and I have been pretty carefree in the sun. Um, not good, it turns out. Um, and apparently us gardeners are really, really bad for it. So my message today in this podcast, seen as though I think it is my last one, is that we really do need to be more careful as gardeners. We need to wear hats, sunscreen, um, long sleeve lightweight shirts if we can. Um, the neck is a really bad area. Lightweight scarves would be a good idea. It does seem like a bit of a pain. I know I am struggling to get into a routine of covering up a bit more and being more sensible in the sun, but we really do need to be careful. Skin cancer is no joke. Um, and also, um, I think I'm guilty of many people of not going to the doctor with things, and it was my wife that persuaded me in the first place. Um, if you do spot any thing on your skin that doesn't look right, <laughs> doesn't look normal, please definitely go and see a doctor, get it checked out. Honestly, they're all lovely people. But this is my message in the last past podcast that I'm going to do, is just be careful in the sun. I know we only get a few days of it here in the UK, but just be careful out there. Um, so yeah, that's it from Andrew Wayne, Head Gardener. If you want to go check me out, on YouTube, you'll find me as the Fully Charged Gardener. Um, you'll also find me on the old stalkergram as Andrew Wayne, head gardener of Eurich Manor. Michael Ellen, thanks for having me on. Anyway, cheers then. Bye. La. <laughs> you just suddenly stopped la la ling then when you realised it was recording. <laughs> I didn't stop for that. I was just coming to the end of my tune. Oh, were you? <laughs> you you yeah. left me a voice message, which you know drives me wild. Um, and it sounded <laughs> like it sounded like you were on fast forward, like you sped it up. You were talking so fast. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> I did, I was in like a dodgy signal area or something, and my dictation wasn't like wasn't catching and it wasn't working so i was like oh okay i'll have to send a little voice to my favorite ellen but it is yeah indeed it's still my least favorite thing as well <laughs> you just like it sometimes you just can't listen to them but you really want to listen to them in an environment where you can't listen and it's like i know, ah! I know and it's just like oh this could have been in text you know <laughs> <laughs> oh anyway how are you are I'm you good. in America. In America? In that America. <laughs> um, yes, I am. Only till next Wednesday. Not for very long. Just a, a fleeting. Cool. Is that when you're back? Uh, I land back on the 8th of June, which is Thursday, but I leave here on the 7th, which is next Wednesday. Oh, you told me the date, but it, it felt like it was mythical in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but a mythical not, date. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, that's cool. What? Why so sure? Are you there for a special birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you are or not. I just made that yeah, up. Like, you just when you said, "Are you there for a special birthday?" You had your little finger in your mouth. You know, yeah, I like, don't know what was happening. Like um, Austin Powers, where he's like oh. one million dollars. That's what you look. I think it looks equally weird to the kids in the car park that were walking past. <laughs> 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 I don't know why I was going to um, like, I that weird, oh, well, it'll, be, it'll be nice to be back to your allotment. It will be. Do you, I have to just say, I'm only here for a couple of weeks because of uh, work commitments in the UK. And um, oh, oh. before I came away, I had all my seedlings and oh. you know, plants and whatnot in the greenhouse, but I couldn't leave them there because they'd have a better chance outside than inside the greenhouse. Yeah. So I planted everything, literally yeah. planted out everything. Plant fest. Yeah. And then uh, gave them all a good water. And for the first time this year, there was a heat wave. So <laughs> they may all be frazzled. I have no idea until I get back. But when? When? I don't remember it being hot here in the last week. It, 
the the two days after I planted them and left them was super hot, and then I think it's got cold again. Yeah, I don't think that hot. I reckon they would be all right, kind of seasonally. I'm sure. You should get a webcam on them. Yeah, on the allotment. The thing oh, is, you know, possible. young no. young plants are are you know not particularly hardy yeah. and they do need water and I've left them for two weeks so I have no idea uh, I'm crowdfunding for some new ones <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll be on Instagram begging people for new plants my um, plant neighbours who are absolutely lovely did say that they would keep an eye on them so hopefully oh, you know anything that looks like it was struggling has been watered but yeah, yeah. we'll okay. see <laughs> Like this heat wave, I really don't remember it because like everyone's now back to having their heating on, which is just absurd. Is it? <laughs> is Honestly. That, is it absurd because you don't think people should put the heating on or because it's absurd because it's still cold at this time of year? That is cold. Like people can put their heating on if they want, but I generally don't like heating anyway. But yeah. <laughs> It is really it? randomly cold. Um, the here it at well, the weekend, so obviously it was bank holiday weekend here as well, and oh, it rained like proper heavy, <laughs> heavy rain. And yeah. usually that doesn't happen for a little while yet, and it, the temperature drops. Uh-huh. But it's been really warm since then. But that's unseasonable as well. So. Uh, oh dear! Well, Ella Mary, I got my first guests are in my Airbnb in Suffolk at the moment, and. I wanted them to have nicer weather <laughs> so they could enjoy the garden more. So <laughs> Maybe they don't want to go in the garden anyway. No, they said it was very nice. So <laughs> they sent me a message. So I'm hoping to get a good review, even though they couldn't find... Oh, no, they didn't tell me, like... Um, they didn't tell me they're, like, two people and they book... Like, I assume two people are going to be, like, sleeping in the same bed as a couple. And then, like, when they arrive, they're like, oh we're just friends <laughs> so like I was like oh well, there's a sofa bed like obviously there's two beds made that could be made up but it wasn't necessarily made up because I just assumed that they were like a couple so yeah so I had to kind of direct them on how to do that from a distance so yeah had you <laughs> and I had to order an emergency sheet <laughs> Have you or have you um, advertised it as a two bed though if you've advertised it as two bedroom you would assume there's two beds well, no, at that point, it was only, I feel because I hadn't had the bedding out at that stage, I just put it as one bed because right. I didn't have the bedding ready. So, yeah, I mean, okay. that's fine. They do them. <laughs> yeah, like we have, we, you and I, we've got um, Airbnbs before and it would mm. be two people on the booking and I'm definitely not going to be sharing a bed with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah I this funny one in Norwich with all the yellow furniture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we also <laughs> had that amazing place in uh, London, like really old, like high uh, ceilings. Yeah, remember that? Oh. I can't remember where that was now. Uh, I don't remember where that was. Somewhere around Chancery Lane, wasn't it? Yeah. And this was the point where everyone was pretending there wasn't a pandemic as well. <laughs> Do you remember it was in that in the kind of dark latter latter weeks of before yeah. you know what? Yeah. <laughs> Such a weird time. I'm looking back. Yeah, Yeah, that's really funny. (laughs) Oh, Ellen, dear me. Oh, Ellen, why do I hate all the food here? When you say here, what does that refer to? (laughs) In England? Gosh, that's a bit harsh. Specifically on the motorway. Oh, well, I'm with you on that. Oh, my God. You must find it even worse for options. But I'm just like, I just want to eat something nice and decent and not just... (laughs) <laughs> Honestly, but it's just horrible. Like, even the fast food is just disgusting. Why can't there be like a nice salad bar or here or there? It's just, oh my God, do people really want to eat this stuff? Honestly, it's just all so gross, Ellen. And you can't get good coffee. And it's just like, oh, makes me so angry. Wow. Anyway, we- Michael, your face is <laughs> contorted through that little rant. Oh my- Honestly, the vignette light from these trees will not even soothe me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not Honestly, wrong. It drives me mad and it must drive you double mad. 
You can never get anything that's healthy. Um, yeah. I know, like some places, if there's an M and S, for example, you can get a little pot of salad or something like that. But generally, it's it's like sloppy sandwiches. It's so tragic. Burgers. If you go in like the little chef places that aren't little chefs anymore, I don't remember. Uh-uh. What. You know, Starbucks occasionally, but it's and and then like Greg's. Do you know what I mean? There's never anything healthy. I completely agree. No nice food anywhere. Even if you go in a little town and you go in a spa or a co-op, it's just it's just total rubbish all the time. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah, oh, you have to like <laughs> you have to make your own food to have. We then just a bit. <laughs> <gasps> Stop swearing. We're going to be beeping you out. I know. Oh, sorry. But then you like have to like take it on the go and it's this and that and it's just like oh. I and do I just have think to... there's no. Oh, sorry, go on. I do have to. Um, if I'm going on a long journey mm. or staying out and not sure where I'm going to be able to eat, I do often yeah. have to make my own food and take it with me. Oh, but how is there not more focus on just providing good food? Yeah. And you, and considering there are government schemes about eating more, like more healthy, eating more plants, for example, like especially for children, and but that in reality isn't, you know, real. It's not there, is it? On the ground. On the scale, and it drives me, gets my dander up. Tell Uh, instead of that, let's uh, let's cheer you up and talk about (laughs) some plants. Where are you going today? Uh, I'm gonna go to Harlow. I'm uh, I'm in the north because I'm Steph's pet lunch tomorrow, and uh, I'm gonna go to Harlow Car and Bridgewater tomorrow or Friday. Um, but Harlow Car particularly because it's like the Mechanopsis season is still there, and my heart skips a beat when I see them, and it's just gorgeous. I can't wait just to see the photograph. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, I can't wait to see your photographs because I did see some. Oh. I think it was um, Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh post. I think it was yeah. there, some the other day, and it was just so oh, absolutely, man. completely oh. stunning. Oh. Oh. It oh, should sorry. be illegal how beautiful they are. You know, are we are we boring you now? <laughs> no, <laughs> but also it's kind of this weird, like. I don't know, like you obviously, you went away straight after Chelsea, so maybe you don't then notice it, but this kind of weird after lull of Chelsea that you kind of just feel collectively a bit because there's all this, I don't know, there's this week when horticulture is all over the news and kind of like weekly, nightly programs and stuff. And then and then suddenly then it's back to normal. It's kind of like, oh, that Chelsea kind of blues at that moment. Yeah. The Chelsea and also blues. because it's then so dull or whatever as well. It's like, oh. I think if you. the weather was if the weather was nicer, that would definitely give everyone yeah. me up, wouldn't it? Yeah. BBC so, Gardeners World yeah. in a couple of weeks, so so not too long before BBC Gardeners World. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and, and June is then like just so busy then with the flower trials in Holland and Glee as well. Will you go to Glee, Millen? Um, I do know what I was thinking. I wasn't going to go, but um, I was talking oh, to God. Zest. Pardon. Come and see me. I'll be there. I might, I might cut. I might come for oh. a day. Um, yes. Yeah, so Zest Outdoor Living, who I've done some work with, as of you, I think too. So I might go up anyway. I mean, if I can on one of the days, I will. What are you doing there? Oh, Tell us all about lovely. it. Tell us all about it. Uh, I did kind of like uh, ambassador work. <laughs> sounds so important. It sounds like I'm gonna do some Swiss convoy or something. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. I've been doing some kind of work in the background, working on the, um, like, uh, what's it called? Concept store. Concept stores that, like, some of the garden centers are building. <laughs> oh, so sorry. Also working on a future plants display. Uh, we're doing some cool presentations. We're doing two-minute sales where suppliers need to talk for two minutes about their product, and they right. only get two minutes. Right. Uh a panel we're doing social media presentations as well yeah it's gonna be cool there melon i'm there every day creating some sexy social media as well which is cool but um i realized now i really want to go to hampton court because you said you're there on press day right yeah i'm gonna go on press day so actually i quite often in the year go to a few gardening shows so obviously we've done chelsea um i'm hosting the houseplant hub on all the days at BBC Gardeners World. So quite often when I get in three or four shows, I'm done with shows. Genuinely, I'm like, I've had enough of shows now. But 
I'm not going to Tatton this year, so I think I'm going to do press day at Hampton, which means I could probably squeeze in Glee as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think Hampton is just an ace show. You know, it's so chill. Do you know, you know, it's mm-hmm. just, it's got all the ace gardens, there's so much going on, it's a bit more of a festival vibe. So yeah, I'm looking forward to going to Hampton. Yeah, I don't know. I saw something in the paper today that made me want to go. I can't remember what it was now. But that is, um, that's also the week of the Fleur Select Convention. So I'll only be there in the morning, Ellen. So well, that's just okay. so you know. <laughs> I don't know what your your creepy message was to me about me being, you wanting to be my friend or something <laughs> on the day. <laughs> Ellen, sometimes I just write you a message and I'm like, all right, I'll just make the last two sentences just a load of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I want to go to Hampton Court this year. Isn't that great? I love that you're my friend. You're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, not that it's not true, but it's me like talking complete trash. <laughs> it's just really funny. <laughs> you're on the, like, are you like thinking like, because I think like, I think your brain, maybe for a split second, thinks it's serious. <laughs> because how your brain works. And so I know that you'll think, even if it's for a half a second, you'll be like, Oh, that's not what? <laughs> <laughs> like for half a second, I'm like, oh, why wow, is finally being really nice to me? And then I'm like, oh, no, no, I realise now. <laughs> oh, honestly. But right. yes, anyway, that will be nice. Um, and yeah, I, I will go to that. So that would be great. Um, and then, so tell us also what you're doing at Steph's Pack Lunch, because last time you were very excited to be, to be covering weeds, weren't you? I was, Ellen Mary. Oh, this toothpaste hasn't even got a, a thing on it how weird oh. <laughs> and usually they've got a little foil thing anyone can get in there um anyway sorry <laughs> you <laughs> carry on it. carry on um last time we did weeds which was really cool um because obviously there's a lot of chat about weeds at the chelsea flower show and all the coverage and stuff do you know what's so funny when i was at my parents at the weekend my mum was talking about the Chelsea Flower Show. She was like, it was rubbish. There wasn't any, like, colourful gardens. There was no, I didn't see any roses. I didn't see any fuchsias. <laughs> it's just like, basically, she didn't see 1982 there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, what? And they talk about the weeds. And she was like, oh, they just look ugly. <laughs> She's like, talking about the lawn or something. It's like, oh, leaving the lawn long is just lazy. <laughs> I was like, what about all the pollinators, Mum? She's like, oh no, it's ugly. It's, <laughs> it's like, it oh my like, god, it's, it's totally really hard work. A, it is a mindset, isn't it? You know, yeah. and, and and some of that generation, they've been brought yeah. up thinking that so it's very difficult to change that opinion. Um, and the but garden I, all looks like this same yeah. thing that. Yeah, and, but also we have to remember, Chel- like Chelsea's in May, and growers have had an like a bit of a problem this year because of the weather. <laughs> So they're ha- you, know, you have to go with also the plants that you can go with for that time of year, you know. There'll be more rose. Everyone's always kind of stuck in the past a little bit, aren't they? It's kind of like, well, things do evolve and the way we want guns is a bit more naturalistic and kind of this is, you yeah. know, ultimately what is a bit better for nature as well. It's just kind of, yeah, it's just it's just funny how um, her vision of what it should be is just very, very troubled. I'm also wondering, does your mum actually speak like that? Like, with the gruff voice? <laughs> does she but ever listen to this? Uh, <laughs> it is, yeah, and it, and it says a lot about the ingrained attitudes to gardening, that, yeah, as well. I have to just give a heads up at this point to uh, Jamie Langlands from uh, who designed the Wildlife Trust Garden at Malvern this year because while mm-hmm. obviously Chelsea gets on the TV and it's like the biggest show and everyone's talking about the weeds there but Malvern was mm-hmm. only a week or two before and the Wildlife Trust Garden won gold best in show and best construction and um, Jamie had also incorporated nettles uh, like a cultivated dandelion no. And this was before Ch- this was before Chelsea this year, so kind of a bit of a trailblazer there. Pardon? Malvern should have a TV show. Malvern is ace. It should have a TV yeah. show. Very <laughs> whiny today. <laughs> you are, aren't you? Very whiny. And hopefully the mechanopsis will cheer you up. Exactly. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, tomorrow I'm also going to go in the afternoon to Arley Hall 
which is quite near Tatton. So right. on the way back, I'm driving back down past Manchester. I'm having a bit of a northern tour, young Ellen. <laughs> young Ellen, and I like that. It does Maybe. sound like you're having a northern tour. Don't you like the freedom to do that? I was like thinking before, yeah. if you, you know, if you do work, uh, you know, yeah. as a non-freelancer, so in whatever it is you're doing, you don't necessarily have the opportunity just to jump in the car and go out for the day if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Just because it is all work and it's then um, weekdays when there isn't everyone else, the world and his wife around as well. And yeah. But then it's the other side of the coin because I, I said to you before I come on the call that I was um, at the weekend, I knew it was kind of my catch up moment because we'd have Chelsea was really busy, the week before was busy. And I was just like, and I had this kind of like whole list of stuff to do and I hadn't replied to as many emails as I wanted to as well and so I was like oh my god I need to catch up it all so on Monday like most of the day I was on this kind of like deep dive into my emails so probably people that didn't expect replies like that had emailed me like 10 days ago suddenly got everything they needed and it was kind of like and I imagine so many people going to work on Tuesday morning like oh my god because I then fired like 20 things at them and stuff. And like, I'd woken from my slumber. And <laughs> after <laughs> emails over them, but it was just like, oh my God. The joy of freelancing. <laughs> yeah, I've been freelance. Because if you work nine to five, you would probably really resent doing that on a Monday, on a bank holiday. But for me, that is, that is a great time to actually catch up. Because if you're then emailing people on a Tuesday afternoon and then they're then replying as you do it, it kind of holds you up and you can't really kind of get all of that work done. Mm. But if you're on a bank holiday, no one no one is there at the end of the email. It's so much easier to then do that. So, yeah, I really, yeah, I wouldn't trade this kind of format for, for anything, young Ellen. But oh, That's <laughs> twice now. That's wonderful for today. Thank you. Um, also, I think it depends on your family situation. So yeah. I'm here in the okay. US. At, I'm here, obviously, at the moment with my hubby. And so even though Bank Holiday Monday or Memorial Day here would have been a day that I would have carried on working, he's off mm. work. He does work in like, you know, in the in the office environment. So like he was off mm. on Monday, so I couldn't really spend all day working because mm. I wanted to go out and do stuff. But if I was at home in the UK, I probably would have just worked. Yeah. Uh, you know? So it is the end. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. But sure. no, um, I like having that freedom. And then like, you know, a day, yeah, because a day like today doesn't feel like you're necessarily doing work. You know? you know, you're just kind of seeing stuff, doing stuff, being inspired. The stuff yeah. that then happened. Are you going to talk yes. about the synopsis on Steph's pack lunch? No, no, that's too advanced. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a kind of like a good kind of almost like cost of living gardening so we're showing how to save seed take some cuttings split plants that you buy in the garden center how to plant up some pots for like a fiver kind of little stuff like that so it should be pretty cool yes. that's nice actually it's funny, talking... I... oh sorry go on talking about taking cuttings this year yeah. has been amazing for hydrangeas all around our neighborhood they are the best i have seen them like oh, really? since i've been here and I'm going to be taking some cuttings, some software cuttings. Like I'm going to go out at night time with my secateurs. Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, what was it? We were going to do like plant risks and dangers in the garden, like toxic plants. But I then um, I just had this idea about cost of living. And I was like, I just emailed them on Monday. I was like, oh, just while I've got this in the head, I'll just like send it to you. And then they completely, this hardly ever happens in TV. They then completely pivoted from the idea of toxic plants to doing my idea. <laughs> this hardly ever happens. And I was like, okay, cool, let's do it. <laughs> you hit the topic, you know, like that's the current topic, isn't it? It's a big topic right yeah. now. And people need to know. I think the toxic plants would have been cool, but it's like, it, I worry this put a lot of, would put a lot of fear out there and we don't want people to be scared of gardening just take care as you go sort of yeah. thing because we're surrounded by toxic plants at the end of the day you know what I mean yeah all of so, the time yeah I'm putting my seatbelt on feeling that we're near the end of the conversation <laughs> yeah I'm like completely bored chatting with you now <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to do it like off camera so you didn't see 
<laughs> Only I can see the seatbelt coming right over your shoulder, across uh, your body. I'm like, right, he's on the move now. <laughs> uh, I've got some note I needed to remember. I can't remember what it, remember what it is now. Mm, anyway, carry on. Uh, I hope you have a lovely day. I look forward to seeing photographs of Mechanopsis because they do make everyone's heart sing when they see them. They're so beautiful. <laughs> cool. Okay. Don't leave me any more. <laughs> don't leave me any more voice notes, though, because that could ruin our friendship. Oh, oh sure. It was efficiency in the extreme. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to the and see what else I can't eat. <laughs> 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 Get a salad Last from like M and S or something. Uh, but then also those salads are never really, never really that good value, and it's always just a pile of crappy lettuce. It's just like, why can't they have interest in salads? They do well. like couscous and um, yeah. all oh, those couscous. salads, that kind oh. of thing. Oh, I'm over or couscous, man. You just have to be more prepared. You have to be more prepared and take stuff with you, like I do. Are you? Squid. He literally just snarled at me. You were like... Uh, <laughs> <of my thing. laughs> All right. It's a pleasure as usual. All right. I, I think the mechanopsis are calling you. All right, babe. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Plant-Based Podcast. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Stonely Wines. Their premium wines in New Zealand are made from 100% sustainably sourced grapes and is vegan certified also. Our favourite Stonely Sauvignon Blanc displays fresh and vibrant aromas of passion fruit and citrus with crisp notes. We have our exclusive discount code for 20% off Stonely Sauvignon Blanc exclusively on Amazon using the code STONELY20. The music for the Plum Face podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Semi Echo.